morning, everyone, and help, happy Social Work Month. Uh, we're going to begin the webinar there now, uh, so thanks for everyone for joining online. Uh, the theme this year, Real Impact, uh, Real People, Real Impact, recognizes and celebrates the contributions social workers make to the health and well-being of individuals, families, groups, and communities. My name is Annette Johns, and I am the Associate Director of Policy and Practice with the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers. I have the honor of being the moderator for today's education event, Understanding Hoarding Disorder. Hoarding is a topic that is of great interest to social workers, and we have over 200 social workers from across the province tuning in for the webinar today. It is wonderful when we can come together as a profession to learn from our social work colleagues and enhance our knowledge and skills. This webinar is a collaboration between the Newfoundland and Labrador Association of Social Workers and the Canadian Association of Social Workers. The webinar presentation will be approximately 60 minutes, followed by a 30-minute question and answer period that I will moderate. Please send in your questions throughout the presentation, and only myself and the presenters will see them. All of the housekeeping details you need, like how to access the recording, where to download the slides, and how to get your certificate of attendance are all included in the housekeeping widget that popped up when you first logged in. So I now want to introduce our speaker, Christina Wakeham. Christina graduated from Amoy University in 2008 with a Bachelor of Social Work. After graduation, she worked as a long-term uh, child protection social worker for four and a half years. She then moved on to work on the Newfoundland work at the Newfoundland and Labrador Housing uh, here in here in the province in September of 2012, where she is currently employed as a complex needs social worker with the Policy Housing and Homelessness Department. Christina completed an addiction diploma through McMaster University in 2014. Her passion is in mental health and addictions working work using a harm reduction approach to practice. Since 2012, Christina has been volunteering in different capacities with outreach harm reduction programs in the community, such as SWAP, Needle Distribution Program, and SHOP, the Safe Harbor Outreach Program. Christina started her Master of Social Work degree in September of 2017. So without further ado, I will now pass things over to Christina to begin the presentation. Hi, welcome to the presentation. How Hopefully everybody can hear me fairly well. Um, I haven't done it. I've done this presentation several times, but I've never done it to nobody in the audience, um, everybody out on computers. So hopefully this goes well. Um, as Annette said, if you had any questions during the presentation, do send them along. Um, and just um, to give a little bit about hoarding and how I kind of became involved in hoarding, because Annette um, did a really great job of giving an introduction of me already. Um, I guess when I started working at Jerusalem and Labrador Housing, I started visiting homes and seeing things, and we were calling it lots of different things, from clutter to collecting. Um, and then we were, I was reaching out um, to resources actually across Canada to kind of get some support in addressing hoarding um, that I was seeing in our Newfoundland Labrador Housing apartments. Um, during that time, I got connected with um, a hoarding expert in Ottawa, um, and she actually help develop the community response for hoarding in Ottawa. Her name is Ms. Elaine Birchall. A lot of the information you have here today comes from training I've done with her. Um, and she continues to mentor me um, through my work at housing. And she's actually my mentor as well um, through my Master's Pathways program. So without further ado, I'm going to get into the presentation. Um, and again, if you have any questions, let us know as we go on. So the first, we're going to start off, um, you guys got to know a little bit about me, so we're going to start off by trying to get to know a little bit about you guys. Um, we're just wondering, um, the first question looks at if you have any experience working with an individual or family who lives in a hoarded environment. We'll give you a few moments to click on the response and we'll get a polling response back from that. Okay, hopefully everyone submitted. All right, so lots of you have experience working, and about 23% said that you didn't have any experience working with hoarding. Um, and maybe after this presentation, some people might realize that they do have experience, or some people might realize that they thought what was hoarding isn't. So we're going to get into some of that in the presentation. For the second polling question, have, have any of you guys received hoarding-specific training? I know myself and a couple of colleagues 
um, with New Florida Labrador Housing and in partnership with um, Christina with uh, Canadian Mental Health have done some trainings in the community. So we're just trying to see um, who out there has specific hoarding training. Right. So there's 3.7%. So hopefully, if any of you guys heard me before, this isn't is a lot, not going to be any new information. But there's uh, about 96% of folks who don't have any experience um, with hoarding. So hopefully, you're able to take some things away from my presentation today. So the final question that I have for you folks is on a scale from one to five. Um, how would you rate your level of knowledge about hoarding? Knowing you don't have any knowledge of hoarding disorder and by feeling like you're an expert on the topic. We'll give people a moment to respond to that as well. Alrighty, so in the not having any experience, we have about 20%, and then two people, or two, uh, for having a little bit of experience, we have around 50%. Um, about 20% of people feel they're halfway within their knowledge base of hoarding. Um, for, uh, um, for the level four, there was 8.3%, um, and nobody felt like an expert, um, which is interesting because I don't feel like an expert in hoarding either. Um, it's something I've been working on for a really long time, but um, lots, there's always lots to learn and grow from, so hopefully some good learnings from this. All right, to get into the presentation, just an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what hoarding is. Um, we're going to look at the distinction between hoarding versus clutter because it's very significant. Um, also look at the signs of a hoarded environment, the process of hoarding behavior and what hoarding looks like, um, the types of hoarding, because hoarding is broken down into several different categories. And we're also going to look at the different saving patterns that people have, um, because that's also really important for interventions in working with folks who are living in hoarded environments. And then we're going to, at the end, talk about some best practice approaches. This is kind of from my experience in working with Elaine, um, and she has a lot more extensive history in working in hoarding than I do. Um, just on that note, she actually has the first Canadian book around hoarding that's supposed to be coming out in the fall. Um, most of the literature that is out there available, it's very limited, and most of it is a U.S. context. Um, so their systems look very different than how our social systems work in terms of what we can and can't do in terms of hoarding and addressing that. So just to start off, what hoarding is, in order to meet the definition for hoarding, it's really important that you have three of these components. And the first one looks at the excessive accumulation and failure to appropriately discard. That's really important because a lot of us in our community today, especially with society being so disposable, a lot of us accumulate excessively. If anybody knew me when I worked at Child Protection, I used to shop for self-care, and somebody would say I excessively accumulate. But fortunately for me, I also like to donate things. So while it was coming into my house sometimes at a rapid rate, it was also able to leave my house. So it's really important that, that ability to appropriately disca discard those things that are coming in. The other big key component to hoarding disorder, to be diagnosed as a hoarding disorder, is it has to appear the activities of daily living. And what that usually looks like in practice when I've been working is that they're not able, say, to use their bathroom. Sometimes folks will start hoarding and fill up their bathtub, so they're not able to use their bathtubs for normal washing and those type of things. Usually what I see, it starts in the spare room, and we all have junk rooms, and it's okay, don't panic. Um, it's okay to have junk rooms, but usually it's when it spills out into other rooms. So lots of folks have a room that they have a lot of stuff and clutter in, but it's when it starts taking up the spaces that you need for daily living, and you're not able to do those things because, or use those spaces for their intended purposes. And the third feature, it causes stress and impairment for the person who's living with hoarding or others. Some folks have been living in these environments for a really long time, so they don't realize how anxious, but most folks who live with hoarding actually wake up anxious every single day about their environment or that somebody may visit their environment or something's going on with their home. So there's a lot of anxiety wrapped up within hoarding, and it does actually fall under an anxiety disorder. So three of these components actually need to be present for to meet the criteria under the DSM and to be diagnosed as a hoarding disorder. In saying that, most of the folks that I've worked with don't have a formal diagnosis of hoarding. Um, as we'll get into in the next slide, 
um, hoarding in the DSM. Hoarding has only become, I guess, a distinct mental health disorder recognized by the DSM in May 2013. Um, and that's, that became really important for us at Newfoundland Labrador Housing because when that got recognized um, under the DSM as a specific mental health disorder, as landlords, we then had a reasonable duty to accommodate folks who are living in that, those situations. So we had a duty to respond. That doesn't mean that if we tried to respond and people didn't work through and work with us to address the risk factors in the hoarded home, um, that we wouldn't have, we couldn't still act on evict people, I guess that's our last resort. But that's what really put the pressure on us to change how we did dealt with folks who are living in high content environments um, because it was now recognized in the DSM. One other thing I wanted to point out about hoarding, hoarding sometimes shows up as um, a symptom of other things. So not always, sometimes when you see hoarded environments, that hoarding is the reason why they've gotten there. I've worked with some folks who have mobility issues, so uh, they've been, they've never had issues with hoarding. They take things into their homes and were able to appropriately discard. But it was more because of mobility that things broke, built up in their home. And one of the things that really shows that it's not hoarding is the attachment level to the stuff. A lot of those folks, if you go in and address the issue, say mobility, and had somebody go in and help that person um, take the things out of their home, they're able <coughs> to easily discard those items because they're not attached to them or they don't have a whole lot of invested meaning in them. So in terms of the uh, prevalence of hoarding, they say that hoarding, and again, these stats are always being, with the being new, D, being recognized in the DSM, there's now more research be happening. There was research happening years prior, but it wasn't to the same extent. And there's now investment in research around hoarding and I guess best practices to address it. But these stats are based on some old information back in 2015. Um, and for folks who live with common hoarding, and we'll get into what that is a little later, it's usually about 5 to 6 percent of the population. And to put that in perspective, in the Avalon region, Newfoundland Labrador Housing has about 3,000 housing units or apartments. Um, so of that population, it would probably be about 150 people who are living with the common hoarding um, as, as a, something that they're living with. Um, Diogenes syndrome is a little bit less. Um, it, well, it's actually fairly rare. Um, and there's probably in that 3,000 population, there's probably about 1.5% of the people who are actually living with Diogenes syndrome. And we're going to get into what that means a little bit later as well. And then the animal hoarding is at about like 0.5%. Um, and again, if you look at that within our population, that would probably be around, <clears throat> I'd say 15, my math's not really good, but about 15, per, 15 people within 3,000 that would be living uh, with animal hoarding. So some of the def demographics of folks who live with hoarding, usually um, there's a lot of research. People thought that hoarding wasn't um, uh, something that folks developed in their older ages, but there's been a lot of research that sometimes hoarding behaviors are starting onset at teenage years. Um, for my wor work working at Child Protection, we often seen like hoarding of food or different types of hoarding behaviors happen. Sometimes when kids have gone through trauma or have been in care or had multiple placements and those type of things. Um, but typically, it's usually thir 35 to 50 when people are seeking out treatment for hoarding behaviors. Um, a lot of folks who live in hoarded environments and hoard do often live alone and have a high divorce rate. Hoarding is like any other mental illness. It doesn't pick any specific race, ethnicity, age, or socioeconomical status. Um, what sometimes you'll see is the difference is the difference in what they often hoard and what they're able to kind of collect. Um, Preliminary studies say that men typically hoard more, but women seek treatment more. In my experience working with folks who hoard, I've only ever worked with three males. Most of the people I've worked with have been females, to be honest, and that probably speaks to the people that are willing to seek treatment. Um, and many people interviewed who hoard indicate that they do have a family history. They're actually doing some genetic research and um, seeing if it, there's some genetic markers on the DNA of folks who have, I guess, people who have hoarding disorder in their family and seeing that going through family histories as well. Um, also, too, they're more likely to have chronic and severe medical problems, and some of that is due to um, 
folks who live in horror environments are often very isolated, so they're not taking care of those medical needs. So even the the minor medical needs gone untreated for a long time often cause a lot of issues for them. And a lot of folks have difficulty paying bills and keeping on top of their, I guess, day-to-day finance stuff, and that kind of comes through the organization of that type of paying the bills and getting on time and trying to organize where it is and getting to the bank and those type of things. So a lot of folks do struggle with payment of bills. Um, On this next slide, um, I wanted to really look at hoarding versus clutter because a lot of what I was calling hoarding when I first, before I became educated on hoarding, was clutter. Um, And a lot of the information we do have about hoarding are also extreme um, examples of hoarding that are often shown in the media and things like that. So the big distinct differences, there are two distinct differences between hoarding and clutter. As I mentioned earlier, um, individuals who clutter often can easily discard the things. Um, And clutter also doesn't interfere the same extent with the day-to-day living. Not all, this is a really great point because when we do see clutter, it's really important if folks are willing to address the clutter to work with people there. Because not all clutter results in hoarding, but all hoarding usually begins with clutter. So even if you do see clutter and folks are willing to kind of work on that thing, work on their clutter with you, I do recommend that you do do that early intervention and not wait till it becomes, I guess, a hoarded environment where it's more difficult to treat. Here are two images um, that um, I've taken, um, and I use this to kind of distinguish between hoarding and clutter. Um, the image, if you're looking at your computer on the left, um, Most people may say that that's a normal porch. I will tell you this is a porch in the middle of the summer. Um, As you see, um, a lot of the winter stuff hasn't been put away, and this person is actually really difficult to open their door um, because of the amount of clutter in their doorway, but it's not a hoarded environment. Um, It's a level of clutter. The person on the right, um, as you see, the person, if you can see the gentleman in the back, he's about six feet tall, so that just gives you a reference for how tall um, the the items have been stacked up. One of the things I want to mention in that picture is this person who um, we were working with, they used to collect um, recycling and cardboard. Those are two main things that they were collecting. So when we started doing some work with them, um, what we realized, they were collecting the cardboard because there was unreported leaks in the apartment and they were addressing it themselves by soaking it up with the cardboard because they didn't want to call us the landlord in Florida Labrador Housing to come in and repair it because they were afraid of what we would see or how we would respond when we came into the environment. Um, The whole idea around and the attachment to the recycling, this person lived with their parents for a really long time and had some financial, I guess, um, security in living with their parents. And after his mom died, he started collecting recyclables as kind of a savings account to kind of keep himself um, in having a little bit of money when, I guess, things got tight. Um, so that was one of the reasons why he was collecting the recycling. So as we'll get on a bit later, understanding why people collect the things they do is really important in intervention. So this slide here looks about some of the signs when you go into a hoarded environment. Um, these are things that we would address if we worked, went into a hoarded environment and risk factors. Um, so you would see extreme collections and storage in the home. A lot of times you'll see it actually spill out into the yard as well. Um, rotting or expired food is also something that's fairly common. Um, we've seen human waste and animal waste as well. Um, some of that's because people aren't able to access the areas to clean up properly. It's not because they don't want to. Um, and I do want to, I guess, just fill in this. Not every hoarder is dirty. Most hoarders are very, very neat and tidy and clean. Um, but sometimes because of um, the amount of clutter that are that's in an environment, you can imagine if, a, say, a mouse got in there and, and, and died, you might not ever see it until you smelt it. Um, the accumulable of bus- combustible materials like newspaper, books, magazines, those type, those type of things are um, commonly hoarded. Um, blocked exits, doorways, um, sometimes you'll see, see um, pathways between where you go in the hall and everything's blocked on either side and you've kind of got a little pathway you can walk towards. Um, as I mentioned before with the gentleman in the previous slide, long-term neglect of the home and maintenance. A lot of folks won't call to have the maintenance things addressed because they're embarrassed to have folks in their home or they're afraid. Um, not working, utilities, water, electrical, 
The permanent use of extension cords, which I learned is really, really dangerous, um, is really common for folks who live in a hoarded environment. And the rats and mice and insect infestations as well um, can also be a sign of a hoarded environment. And I will tell you, I did a lot of work um, working with folks who have bed bugs. And when you have both bed bugs and hoarding mixed in together, it makes the inter intervention really, really challenging because most of the things in those um, homes actually had to go um, in order to treat, in order to treat the environment. So this next slide looks at the process of hoarding. And I changed this slide because it used to be a linear process. And for most of us, the process of using things is very linear. In terms of we acquire things, we'll use them, we'll consider discarding them, um, and we'll often evaluate the uses if it's recyclable, if we can donate it, if we have a friend or family that might want to need it. Um, and usually we can make a decision at that point. For folks who live with hoarding disorder, this is when the obsessive thoughts kick in. And they're not able to kind of deal with those obsessive thoughts about what they should do with the environment, with the item. So they kind of save it as a kind of way to deal with the anxiety and, and have some relief and because they don't need to think about it for now. But what often happens, they'll acquire another thing, and then the cycle continues and continues until the home builds up to a place where it gets to a safety hazard. Because not every home is a safety hazard, but most homes, if untreated hoarding, will become a safety hazard for both the individuals, folks visiting emergency responses, and also neighbors. All right, hopefully I'm not talking too fast. Hard to get any feedback from you guys, <laughs> so I'll just carry on. Um, this next um, slide goes into the types of hoarding. And when we looked at the prevalence uh, or the prevalence of hoarding, these are the different categories we were talking about. So common hoarding is about 5% of the population. Um, and Diogenes syndrome um, was lower than that, and the animal hoarding was even lower, or Diogenes was uh, 0.05, and animal hoarding was 0.5. So that's the prevalence. So that's the three different categories. It's important to note under Diogenes syndrome, some people often call it domestic squalor, um, and also there's some conflicts for people who work in the hoarding world about whether Diogenes syndrome actually falls under hoarding. But I did leave it in there because um, I see a little bit of that, and I've actually had someone consult yesterday about uh, Diogenes syndrome as well. So to go in a little bit more detail of what these um, breakdowns are, under common hoarding, there's three subcategories. Um, there's discriminate, indiscriminate, and combined. And when people are in a, a discriminate phase of hoarding, they often see they're kind of like specialists. They're saving one or more specific items. Sometimes you'll see collections of dolls, teapots, books. It could be anything. Um, and they have a high attraction value to the person. Um, so a lot of folks will start out this way, where they're, they're collecting collectible items, and they specifically save those type of items. Um, if you have space, I always say, like, you can have collections of things if you have the space and you're able to utilize it and still be able to utilize your home. Um, it's when it, you meet those three criteria where you're not able to use those living spaces and it's causing anxiety and stress for folks um, in, and impairing their ability to do day-to-day -day living activities. Um, under the second category, it's indiscriminate uh, hoarding, and those folks um, would be hoarding almost anything. They would be hoarding anything that they kind of got their hands on, and it can be a chaotic mix from anything from human waste to valuable items. I've gone into people's homes where they're collecting art, um, but they're also, for different reasons, not using their washroom and collecting their feces as well or they're collecting um, bottle caps and all these different things. But in in terms of, like, there's no real value to the items, they're kind of just collecting whatever it is that they can kind of access. They're not actually discarding anything. And the third um, category is the combined hoarding. So that would be folks, um, if you went into their homes, you may see that they have a couple of collectible items and be able to distinguish that from everything else you saw in the clutter, but everything else would be a chaotic mix. But you would see probably, um, you could see a whole bunch of teapot sets or a whole bunch of books and those type of things. Typically when you see that, the things that folks collect, like in terms of those valuable specific items, usually they're harder to get rid of. So if you're doing work with somebody who's living with combined with 
having a whole bunch of things that are just general like clutter and a couple of specific items, you want to start with the general clutter first. Diogeny syndrome, um, a lot of folks who live with Diogeny syndrome, there's a severe amount of self-neglect. Um, a lot of times there's environmental squalor as well. So when you see this, um, usually what you're walking into is like rotten food, rotten like garbage not taken out, and those type of things. I've come across this on two different occasions. Um, and both of the times that I've actually come across it, we've had to take the person to the hospital immediately because they've gone so long without getting their health care needs met and the environment that they were living in was such um, was, was so severely impacting, I guess, their, not only their mental health but their physical health as well. Um, a lot of people who live with diabetes syndrome also live alone, and they're also usually really, really bright and recluse and socially isolated. Um, one of the ladies I was working with, she didn't go outside her home or anything. Everything came into her home, um, but she never came, went outside of her home. And that's becoming more and more easy now with online shopping and those type of things, being able to deliver things to our door. Um, so that's one of the concerns I have with some of the auto automatic shopping and stuff like that um, and not having to kind of go out and interact with the community. The third type of hoarding that we're going to talk about today is animal hoarding. Um, and from experience, I will tell you, this is the hardest to address. The majority of people who um, are living with animal hoarding start out really wanting to help animals. And they're motivated. They see themselves as like little animal shelters or rescue, pet rescue places. Um, and they start out with some really great intentions in terms of trying to help um, the animals in their community. But what actually happens is they take in so many animals um, and they become attached to these animals. People um, become very attached to animals, as they do, and they replace their human connections. And most hoarding people, folks who are living with hoarding, they're replacing human connections a lot of times with stuff. And when it comes to animal hoarding, they're replacing those connections with animals. So you can imagine how difficult it is to address that when people have a, a bond and a connection to their animals. Um, a lot of times when you see animal hoarding, what you'll see is there will be a large amount of animals. Usually, in my experience, it's a specific type of animal. I've seen cats hoarded, lizards, um, and dogs have been the two, two. Cats are mostly the main thing that I've seen in terms of animal hoarding. Um, usually, folks who, um, who in those environments, they're not able to provide the minimal nutrition to themselves or to the animals. The environment is unsanitary, and they're not able to keep up with the veterinary care. You can imagine in a home having 20-plus animals in it. It takes a lot of work to keep up on that many animals, and if you don't have the proper equipment and supplies to do that, the home becomes very overwhelming very quickly, and it also becomes really unsafe for the individual um, and the animals because they're breathing, breathing in, like, feces and the ammonia and stuff like that from urine and those type of things. Um, failure to act on these conditions usually will create a deterioration for the animals and the environment. Um, and also, people don't seek support for themselves. So often, a lot of folks who are living in this, these environments also have a lot of health issues that are going on, and they're not getting their own health issues addressed either. So this next slide, and I hope I'm not zipping by too quickly, looks at um, the common traits of individuals who live with hoarded who live in hoarded environments. Um, some of the things, and I mentioned this earlier, um, but the belief that emotional comfort comes from objects. A lot of folks who are living with hoarding um, are really emotionally attached to their items and the stuff that they have, and if it's gone, they feel like those emotions. So an example of that would be um, some somebody who has their house full of a whole bunch of things, but when you get down to the root cause of what triggered the hoarding behavior, it might have been grief and loss from family member. Um, so w the work around that is more talking about the really important emotions and memories that they have with having this item, but talking about how that item doesn't carry that, that that is internal, that we have that in our memories and those type of things. And while we keep a couple of things sometimes to trigger happy memories, it's kind of working with folks to see, to minimize how many treasures they keep 
from their their loved ones who've passed on instead of keeping. I mean, I've seen whole houses um, where they've never gone into rooms that the person's left, and then things are just piling up on top of that um, because they haven't dealt with the grief and loss from that um, from that loved that loved one. Um, I've also seen it um, in cases where children have been removed, um, and parents will keep every single thing that they have for their child with the hopes that when they're 16, they can give them every single birthday card, every single um, present and those type of things. And when I work with folks from that perspective, I usually talk to them about keeping really memorable things. But if you're keeping a toy that you bought for your child when they was two years old with the plan to give them to them when they're 16, do you think that they you're holding on to that? Do you think that they may want it or that it will even be age appropriate? So it, other ways that talk about other ways that you can kind of keep those uh, memories, but also to be able, to, I guess, to prove to your adult child that you never ever, or your older child that you've never ever forgotten about them. Sometimes you could do that by journaling and writing to them. So just finding different alternatives um, to get at the root causes of why they're hoarding. I talked about grief and. Sometimes people don't discard things because of the attachment and the intense emotions attached to that. Um, another big thing, a common feature for folks who live in hoarded environments is the hyper-responsibility for objects. And in those, in those folks' homes, a lot of things you'll see is the recycling. Um, Elaine, uh, my community mentor, she has a, a client that she works with, um, and he's, he's very, very well off. Um, but he has a hyper-responsibility for Tim Horton's cups. So whenever he sees a Tim Hortons cup discarded in the community, he picks. He feels the need and the compulsion to pick it up and bring it home, which is fine if he was going to recycle it and appropriately discard it. But then obsessive thoughts come in play of like he needs to clean it to make it almost brand new before he can recycle it. So that's where the accumulation happens because if you can imagine if you picked up every single Tim Hortons cup you saw on your travels today and then went home and wanted them cleaned to a pristine way before you can recycle them, that's very labor intensive and to be able to keep up on that, there would just be an accumulation because you wouldn't be able to process um, all those things or all those cups um, in a timely manner. Um, the other thing folks sometimes struggle with who live with hoarding is a feeling of loss or, or identity. So if they lose or don't have items anymore, that their identity is really held in those items. So a lot of work is done around building self-esteem and building their identity um, and keeping the things that are really important and meaningful to reflect their identity. Um, the interesting thing I find with folks um, who live in hoarded environments, a lot of the needs that they're trying to get met are very similar needs that most of us are trying to get met from day to day, but it just gets out of control. So getting back to working on the reasons why um, the hoarding had begun in the first place. And this kind of segues into a ne to our next slide really well, because um, there's three distinct saving patterns, and it's important for us when we're working with folks who live in hoarded environments to know the distinct saving patterns because that's helpful in how we kind of do the work that we do with folks. Um, so just as like our first slide, the three ones are instrumental, sentimental, and aesthetic um, saving patterns. And we're going to go into what those, what those mean. So in terms of instrumental, um, those are folks that keep things just in case. I always joke that in this part of the presentation that my dad is like this. He has a shed that he built that he wanted to do carpentry work in, but it is full of stuff and you can never do carpentry work. Luckily, the rest of the house isn't like that. So I'm keeping him my eye on him. Um, but he often will collect, he's a carpenter, so he brings home things that he thinks like that we may need later on to kind of fix things and those type of things. He's keeping everything just in case, and a lot of that comes from people not having a lot or being really, really frugal with their stuff. But often when they do keep those things, they're not asking the person that they're keeping it for if they even want it. So things are just building up just in case Johnny might want this or Johnny might want that. But it never, ever goes anywhere because they've never told Johnny that they had it for him. And also, they've never even asked Johnny if that's something he wanted. So when I work with folks um, who are keeping things just in case and they've kept things for specific family members or those type of things, we often are part of the um, – in addressing the hoarding is getting them to connect with their loved one and giving them that item to see if it's something they want. And if the family member doesn't want it, it's working with them to kind of discard that item because 
even though they're keeping it for that family member, the family member don't want it, and to respect that family member for that reason. Um, I see this a lot um, with low-income families, and often, especially if you're low-income and you actually come from a high-income family, a lot of people will donate things, donate things, donate, and people are really kind and don't want to say no, um, that they don't need this, so they just keep it, and they're just keeping it just in case they may need it. Um, so sometimes it's about boundaries and saying, being able to say no to the things that um, people are trying to donate and bring into your home, too. Under, under the sentimental, and um, it, most of this is about it means too much to part with. A lot of this is around grief. It could be the loss of a family member. It could be the loss of a job. If you were really, say, if you were a teacher and you no longer could teach anymore and you wanted to keep all your supplies or all your school things. Um, a lot of times the items that people keep really invoke happy memories of the past. So it's about working with people and focusing on how to tap into those happy memories without keeping the stuff. Because ironically enough, um, those things that they kept for the happy memories, they often get buried under the other stuff that they're collecting. So some of the work might be decluttering the other stuff that has no value and making space for those past happy memories. Because as I said earlier, we don't want people to get rid of everything. The things that are really important for to people and they, they have space to keep, um, they can keep it like any like any of the rest of us, right? Um, and I will want I do want to say that hoarding interventions are supposed to be done voluntarily. It's only when there's severe risk involved that you can actually force a hoarding intervention on somebody. And that would be like a safety risk in terms of health, fire, those type of things. Aesthetics. I always say that I'm going to fall under this one because I really buy things because I love things, um, and this is very pleasure based. You get really, you buy things because they have a certain characteristic or it looks a certain way. Um, everything's really special and unique, um, those type of things. And when you're working with people who have more of an anesthetic uh, form of collecting, you want to really figure out what is unique to them. Because if they say every single thing in their house is unique, then it's a really hard place to start from. So you kind of want to target in what's really unique to them, and start at the things that doesn't have those unique features, if that makes sense. But yet, folks here really get a lot of pleasure, so some of the times it's about how do they get pleasure and seek pleasure in other ways, and working with people on building other ways to um, get the pleasure needs that they're getting from the stuff that they collect. So this part of the presentation looks at best practice um, in terms of addressing hoarded environments. Um, when we address hoarding, it's really important to do it in a collaborative way. Um, one of the things I learned from Elaine um, that we did wrong at housing at first was we were trying to do it by ourselves. And in addressing hoarding, um, one of the things we know, it is very time consuming. It takes a long period of time. Not only is it intense, but it's intense over a long period of time. And it takes a lot of resources to address. So if any one agency or department or program took this on, it would take it would be really consuming, not only resource wise in terms of financially, but also time. So it's really important to connect to partners. Um, one of the things in terms of working with people who live in a hoarded environment, if you have the luxury of somebody allowing you into your home who um who is who are living in a hoarded environment, you should really respect that. It takes a lot, a lot for folks to open the door to us when they're living in an hoarded environment. There's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt, and and things wrapped up, and they don't want you to out themselves to you. So if they've opened the door and outed themselves, it's really important that our next steps are really, really gentle. One of the things I always say, because um, I've walked into these environments, and they're sometimes very, very overwhelming, um, but it's really important when you go in there not to zero in on the stuff and be very person-focused, um, and keep the questions to how they're doing, how they're feeling, versus the environment and what's going on around them. Lots of times when we go into these environments, we'll make assumptions of why they might be keeping them or what they're keeping. Um, it's really important to kind of not do that and keep the discussion really, really broad at the beginning so that we can listen and hear from the from the person why and what um, kind of, what kind of 
brought on the hoarding behavior or what, what kind of led up to and the history that kind of came before and the reasons of what they keep and why they save the things they do. Um, most folks that I've worked with don't actually ever call themselves a hoarder. I've only actually worked with one woman who, um, as soon as I walked in, she called herself a hoarder. Um, and it was a very sensationalized view of hoarding from the show hoarders. I mean, she's obviously watched a lot of them, and she does have hoarding disorder. Um, but she used that label as a label that the media kind of put on it versus it's her own label. Most folks will talk about it as their clutter or their collections or their stuff. So what I always say, use the language they're using. Don't call folks a hoarder. Um, and if I am using the word, um, I try to say that the environment's hoarded versus the individual's a hoarder. Um, and again, it's not about the stuff. It's about changing their feelings, attitudes, and relations to their possession and why. And, how, and it's, again, not about even cleaning the stuff up, but getting at the root causes to hoarding um, and, and breaking down the shame and blame and guilt that they feel so that they're able to kind of move forward through the cycle of change. I can't stress enough, and I think we all know this in our work, the importance of relationship building. Um, don't confront denial. A lot of folks, and like any of us, if we're dealing with anything, we're in denial. Um, I had somebody explain domestic violence to me in a way that she just woke up. She was like, he just started picking away the paint and woke up at one day the wall was blank. Um, it's a really great reference for hoarding. People don't just wake up and live in a hoarded environment, right? Um, weight gains the same way. We gain one pound at a time, and then all of a sudden now we're 50, 60, 70 pounds more than what we expected to be. So it's so important to not confront people on why we think they might be doing things or what they need to do and kind of really work with them from where they are. Um, again, address the shame and not blame. It's not their fault. Um, and as we all know, language is very, very powerful. Um, and I do say slow and steady wins the race. Um, I'm actually in a place where I'm working with a team now, and it's been four years. <laughs> We've been four years getting the right team together um, and the right support in place to do an intervention and get mom in the place to do an intervention. Um, so it is slow and steady wins the race, um, and which can be really frustrating in a lot of our work because we're so crisis driven and we're trying to get things done and kind of moved on. But this type of work takes a really long time. I worked with um, an adult and I was visiting his house over a year before I got him to open the door it was only his room that was hoarded, and he was living in a family home, and it took him a year to open the door to show me. And even before that, like, I did things like, well, draw me a picture of what the room looks like. Explain to me what it is. So just kind of getting closer to that room without actually physically getting in there, right? So some tools like that to kind of, kind of ease your way into people's space and respect people's space when they do allow you in there. Um, Again, the individual is the expert. Um, they're really important because they're they're the person who really we can unlock the code to filling to addressing the the clutter in their life. Um, and creating safety is key. Um, people are often isolated. It talks, takes them a long time to allow you in their space. But sometimes people come with a lot of trauma too. Um, and creating safety is really, really important in um, addressing the work. And that's creating safety for them emotionally, but also, too, being honest about safety concerns that are in the home. Um, sometimes we do, when we go into environments, and we'll get into that in the next slide, um, need to assess the risk and address um, any risk concerns that are, I guess, big safety issues. So when I talk about a team approach, these are just a few examples of who could be on a hoarding team, I guess, um, or do a hoarding intervention. I've done various, um, with, and the teams look different depending on the family and who you're, or the individual, whoever you're engaging with. Um, but I've had teams where there's been child protection, psychologists, social workers, case managers, OTs. Um, AESL has been involved, housing has been involved. So like, it's a huge team of community partners that often co need to come to the table. Um, and because it's now recognized as a mental health disorder, referrals can be made through the mental health services and programs to get people access to case management and those type of supports to address the issues um, of hoarding. One of the things, I guess, um, why they keep allowing me to do the work around hoarding at, in my job that I work in is one of the things we know about hoarding is the high, high risk for eviction. 
because you can imagine living in the private market. Um, if a landlord comes in and sees these environments, um, a lot of times they don't have the skills or the resources to help support somebody, so they're getting evicted into homelessness because of the hoarding behavior. And what we often see, if that goes unaddressed, is that they cycle homelessness, get housed again, and then the hoarding ramps up even faster. So the team looks very, very different depending on the resources and who you, who um, who needs to be involved in the in the response. So these are just step by steps. Some of the tools that Elaine has given me in terms of the work that I do in addressing um, hoarding within New Salem Labrador Housing. So this first step when we go into the homes is assess the risk as we do in most of our work. Um, and when we talk about risk, we're talking about the risk to residents. Um, the risk to the resident lives in the home, so it's really important to know if there's anybody else living in the home. Um, depending on the ages of the people in the home, risk can look different. If you have elderly folks living in the home, there's huge risk factors for tripping, falling, those type of things. Um, if you, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have really young children in the home, there's a whole bunch of risk factors with small objects and just um, organization and, and safety hazards with stuff being piled up high and could topple over and those type of things. Um, so we need to assess the risk when we do go into the environment um, and also risk to first responders. I often will tell folks, um, and I, I tell them this if it's true, um, first responders have, can refuse to respond to your space, right? If they can't get in and access you in a safe manner and they're putting themselves at risk, um, they, ca they can deny you emergency response, which doesn't happen very often, but you can imagine if somebody is going in um, trying to have to take you out in a stretcher and you only have like a two foot wide pathway, that would be really, really hard for them to be able to do their work or even be able to even work on you if you were having a heart problem or if they had to do CPR or anything like that. Um, once you've done that and you've assessed the risk, you want to look and think about who else needs to be involved based on what you discovered. Um, I've gone out to homes where I've had to call child protection um, because there's children in the home and there's safety risks. Usually when I do that, I let the person know that I'm calling child protection. They just don't, I don't usually call child protection without them knowing. They know that I did just um, for transparency and for building that relationship with them. Um, Sometimes when I've gone out to homes, I've had to call the health inspector or the fire department because it's, I'm not qualified to um, assess fire safety risks, but I, I see things that trigger me to think that there's fire safety risks. Maybe we need to get professionals in to properly assess those things. So based on your assessment, the next step is to think about who else needs to be on your team to get the job done and, and done in a timely, in timely way. And then once that, once you get the folks around the table, it's really important to meet together and make a team as a plan. Um, one of my early on learnings, um, I was working with a gentleman who was living in a hoarded environment, and he was the most neat, tidy, organized, and risk-managed hoarder I've ever worked with. Um, and there was a severe amount of safety concerns I saw there from a fire perspective. Um, and we actually were able. We actually found we found about the environment because we had a fire several several houses down, um, which was also a hoarded environment. And when the neighbor said, "If you think that's hoarding, go to the other end of the block." And when we did go in there, um, there was some significant risk. And we had the fire department in. One of the learnings I had is I didn't meet with the fire department before I went in there to explain the risks that I saw. And this guy was a really bright guy. He, had, he was very, very resourceful. He had fire ladders to every single window. He had emergency exits. He was hypersensitive about safety. So when I brought the fire department in about my concerns, um, he had responses for every single safety concern that we were, th we were there to address. So it was really hard to kind of motivate him to, to do anything to change. While there was significant risk, there wasn't immediate fire risk. So we had to work with him really, really slowly to address the environment. But so it's really important as a team to meet so to make sure everybody's on the same page when you are doing the work. Um, step three, and I think that this should be kind of step one, is control the reactions um, and the sites uh, when you go in the hoarded environment. Um, one of the things that uh, tricks of the trade that I learned is put some menthol, menthol under your nose because sometimes you go into people's homes and you can't help but react because there's a smell or whatnot. So 
So if you're if you're preparing for that up front, then at least then you don't have when you are hit with a smell. If you have a little bit of uh, spearmint menthol underneath your nose, that um, takes away the intensity of it, and you're able to kind of be um, more yourself. And you're not kind of responding to the environment. Um, be aware of our judgments. Um, even when we don't judge folks and we're going in very non-judgmental, sometimes the words we say, how we might look at something, or our non-verbals. Folks are really hypersensitive to have you in their environment, so sometimes they m might perceive actions that you do not intend to be um, judgmental at all as a judgment. So just be really, really cautious when you're interacting with folks and, and making sure, and reading their nonverbals as well to kind of make sure um, that you're not offending them and that they understand where you're coming from. I have allergies, so sometimes I'll break into sneezing, but I'll blame that on a medical thing versus saying, oh, you got a lot of dust in here, right, or you haven't dusted in a long time which I haven't either in my house. Um, but, yeah, so just re be really cautious about our reactions when we're interacting with people. Um, remember, it's re um, tied to an underlying cause, right? So the referrals to other services may need it. Um, I use centralized intake here in St. John's a lot um, to make referrals for case management or psychology, um, for psychiatry if we're able to do that, which is a long wait list, but the referrals, get those referrals in because sometimes this takes a long process. So if we have them in early, um, maybe when we're ready to get interventions, the stars will align and people will be um, ready to provide service to the individual as a team. Um, bring tools to leave with the tenant, like handbooks and those type of things. Um, often when you're doing those things, though, try and put, put them in a place where they're not going to get lost in the clutter. Um, don't bring in too many things. And also, too, when you're leaving, one of the early things that I did as an inexperienced person working with a hoard environment, if they would give me anything to take with me when I was leaving, I would take it because I was thinking that at least it's one less thing in their environment. But that's not helping them address the underlying issues of why they're, they're, they are hoarding. So if you are bringing in, bring minimal things into the home, and if you are bringing tools in the home, make sure they're tools that people can access um, and you're, they're put in a place um, and probably, like I've laminated it or put it in plastic um, so that you can kind of keep them in a place and have them um, accessible to use. Step four, um, be really, really patient. Ask questions and respectful and listen to what people have to say. Um, Sometimes when you go into a really chaotic environment, you get really overwhelmed and you want to ask like a whole bunch of questions because of curiosity or just out of interest or even just to do our work. Um, but just make sure if we are asking questions to folks that they're meaningful and they're about the work um, and we're not asking people in a rapid fire way. We're being really supportive and having a really, I get like li listening and allowing for that dialogue to happen. And when we do that, we can see what fears they actually do have and what they need to motivate change. Um, one of the big, I guess, barriers to addressing hoarding is procrastination. Um, and it's not that people don't want to address the hoarding. It's just, as any of us, if we try to make any change, it's natural. It's a natural coping mechanism, I think, to procrastinate. For me, at least it is. Um, so just working with people and understanding the whole role of procrastination and where that goes in the motivation to change. Um, Set small, realistic goals for decluttering and limits, and acknowledge really small successes. And that might be just taking, I have one lady, we had a foot in a corner that she had clear, and her goal was to vacuum that every day and keep that space clear. And sometimes, for a long period of time, that might be all she's able to do. And then hopefully you are able to move that and, and move those successes out throughout the home. Um, so acknowledging the really small successes is important. Um, Get appropriate um, help from people who have information about hoarding, um, and, and that sometimes includes trusted family or friends. Um, I know when I've done interventions with folks, if they don't have experience and because I've been trained, and there's other people in the community that have been trained by Elaine um, as well, I wanted to say, um, just try and get somebody who has some knowledge to either share that knowledge or go research it so that you are more informed when you are doing work, like any other clientele that we work with who we're not really familiar with. Get the information so that we know we're doing things appropriately. Um, really promote decision making, discarding, and organization, being mindful of the saving pattern that we talked about earlier. Um, a tool in step six that folks we use with folks who um, 
are decluttering is called a three and a half box technique. Um, you can get more information. Elaine has a website. It's called www.hoarding.ca. So some of these tools you can actually get on her website. Her websites. Um, and there's also a really great clutter image rating scale that you can get there as well. Um, but this three and a half box technique looks at once we've made a decision about something, so it's really important when you're working with folks, if people made a decision to donate it, we only touch it once and it goes in a donate box, and then when we leave the house, that comes with us. Um, because if you leave it there, they'll second guess, they'll churn about it, and perhaps half of the stuff that you've already made a decision about will actually come back out into the home. So when you've made a decision about something, it usually I always recommend that it goes out of that home that day, and that includes not just putting it out into a garbage can outside the home. Because as you can imagine, the person's in the home, they know that that's out in the garbage can, and they're really compelled to go get that. Um, and then there's a lot of guilt and shame wrapped up in that. So we're all possible, if they've made a decision to get rid of something, whether to donate, to throw it in the trash, or to keep it, put it in those boxes, and if it's trash or donate, it needs to be removed after that day. Um, the half box is for unopened mail, typically, or um, papers that you'll see. Um, that's really overwhelming sometimes for folks to go through. So often we'll just keep a half box there, a smaller box, where people can just put their documents. Um, one of the reasons for that is we don't want people to lose, like, birth certificates or, say, if they did lose their child in care, they may have a letter or something that looks really insignificant to us or might look like garbage, um, and it's one of their most valuable things. So really, um, the, around the documents and finances, make sure that they're separated because often a lot of that stuff gets lost in the clutter. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm just going to quickly run through the last few slides. Um, the, la the second slide, or this next slide, looks at clearouts. Clearouts are not recommended. And the reason they're not recommended is because there's a really high recidivism rate and it's very, very traumatic for the individual. They do happen from time to time and I've been involved. One time was to address bed bugs. Um, we had to clear out their whole house um, in order to address the bed bug situation and the tenant bought into that. Um, so, but clear outs are really, really um, traumatic for folks and they typically are not effective what we often see when we clear somebody out, and if we kind of the same thing, if you lose a whole bunch of weight at the same at one time, we'll often gain it back quicker, faster, those type of things. The same thing happens with hoarding. So if you clear somebody's house out, that causes them a lot of stress and anxiety. And if you haven't got at the root causes of why they hoard, typically what you'll see is a hoard at a faster, higher, intense rate, um, and things will get uh, fairly overwhelming very, very quickly. Um, and again, if you do have to do it, be very, very respectful if you do. Um, clear outs for me are a risk thing. The only reason to do a clear out is if there's immediate safety risks and you need to do that in order to keep the person safe. So some of the key messages I wanted you guys to take away from this, um, I guess, session today is um, because hoarding is now a mental health diagnosis, we now have different tools to kind of address hoarding through our mental health system, but also um, the responsibility of landlords, because even private market landlords do have a, di a duty to accommodate. Um, and if somebody does, even private, if we're advocates for folks in the community and they're in a private market rental, um, some of the work might be working with the landlord to, to let them know how we're going to support somebody in working through the hoarding. Um, but it's really important um, now that it's a mental health, a distinct mental health disorder, to I guess uh, get the right supports and services for folks so they can address the issues. Um, I think I've mentioned this several times: the importance of co community partners and the collaboration. Um, a lot of the most effective hoarding interventions I've seen, there's been partners with community, government, and families, most and not-for-profit type of organizations. So it's really about kind of getting all partners on board and, as I mentioned earlier, communicating with all partners so that we're addressing it from the same angle. Again, too, I wanted to highlight it's not about the stuff. It's getting at the underlying reasons of why people are um, hoarding. And the key to any success in addressing hoarding is getting as, as many mental health issues as addressing the stigma and shame that comes with it. If we don't get at addressing the stigma and shame, it's really difficult for the person to be able to process and move through the stages of change. And what you'll see is they'll often stay stuck and they'll start what 
in the literature they call churning, which they'll just they'll be really anxious and want to really motivated to do things and make changes in their environment. But what they end up doing is spending a lot of time and energy moving stuff around their house um, and just making decisions and t- thinking about things and moving around and moving around um, and never really getting ahead of um, the issues that um, the hoarding behavior has kind of uh, resolved from. So we're getting to the end of the presentation there now. We just have a couple of more polling questions that we'd like folks to answer. Um, the, the first one is, after the information we've heard, would you say you've worked with somebody who's struggling with a hoarding disorder? And I wanted to get at here to see if folks um, now with this information, I guess, have had another a different view of hoarding um, and what clutter is. And keeping in mind hoarding, you have to have those three distinct characteristics in order for it to be classified as hoarding. We'll give folks a moment to respond. Okay, so the results have changed. So I guess some people have changed a little bit from what they thought hoarding was and wasn't, um, which is good to share here. Um, let's look at the next polling question. Was the information presented relevant to your work? All right, most of the folks see that it's relevant. Um, there was 83% and 16 kind of not feeling it's relevant. And when we look at relevance, we might not do direct hands-on frontline things, but for example, if you're with AESL, maybe your role is to help facilitate some funding to help get cleaning services in or get a garbage bin. I've used AESL for those reasons to get approval for funding for a garbage bin to put outside to put the stuff in. So we all have different roles depending on our capacity, but I do appreciate there's some people that would be really far away from working with folks who live with hoarding. So this gets to the end, um, so if you have any questions, hopefully if you've sent them in or you still have time to send them in. Um, if you have any additional feedback or anything like that that you want to send along, my email's there um, at Newfoundland Lab or Housing, and it's wrong. I put, I put it in wrong. It's actually K.M. Wakeham, W-A-K-E-H-A-M at N-L-H-C dot N-L dot C-A. There's supposed to be an M between the K and W just to correct that now that I'm looking at the email. Um, posted. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'll uh, read them out and try and respond to them. My goodness, <clears throat> Christina, that was phenomenal. We do have some questions coming in, um, so feel free to keep them coming in. We still do have uh, lots of time. Um, so the first question is, Is are there comorbidity patterns with people who hoard? Specifically, is there a relationship with PTSD? In terms of comorbidity, I actually took that out of um, a previous slideshow that I had done. Um, there's a lot of comorbidity factors with hoarding, um, from Alzheimer's to ADHD to some people on autism spectrum. Um, in terms of PTSD, there are folks that, that would have a comorbid factor, but there's not a lot of great research on PTSD and hoarding. Specifically, um, there's been a lot of research on the comorbidity of hoarding and OCD because hoarding for a long time was considered, they thought it was like a, a kind of a subset of an OCD behavior. Um, but what they found, only like 30% of folks who live with hoarding actually have characteristics of OCD. Um, so in terms of the PTSD, I wouldn't be able to specifically say. Um, I have had experience working with people who have been diagnosed with PTSD um, and um, have had hoarding behaviors. Um, a lot of that trauma, the, pe the folks that I've worked with um, have been um, people who have lived like in New Canadians, refugees who've come from like war-torn places. Um, where access to resources were very, very limited. Um, and then when they come here and there's like a copious amount of access to resources, sometimes you'll see um, people collecting because, uh, just in case, right? Because they didn't have it before, they didn't have access. Or now that they do, they don't, the, the practice when they were living in their other country might be to save everything. Um, but they, that's not a necessity here. Um, so I did, have seen it sometimes um, from people who have come from different cultures, specifically if there's been um, 
a lack of resources or access to resources because they've come from like refugee type of type of environments and those type of things. Hope that helps. Thank you. Um, another question. In terms of the categories, instrumental, aesthetic, sentimental, how do we grasp understanding when clients only hoard their when clients only hoard their, their own human waste? This is a challenging one to address with both cognitively well and unwell individuals. Any feedback on this specific issue based on your experience? I've had two experiences, both with females actually, um, who are hoarding human waste. Um, one of them we never ever actually got at the root cause of what hap why um, she was hoarding, but the other person I was working with that was hoarding human waste, it was around schizophrenia, um, and it was around some paranoid delusional thoughts of if she um, allowed her waste to go out into the public stream that she was at, it was actually being tested and people were taking her DNA and doing things with it. So it was more around a paranoia, um, schizophrenia thing. Um, and what we saw once we got that addressed um, and properly addressed, um, those behaviors changed. Um, but in terms of human waste, a lot of times I've seen it's, it's, it's either – about control, I've seen human waste to be in about control in terms of like um, sometimes women who come from domestic or anybody I guess uh, women I just it just comes to me more quickly I, but um, who come from violent relationships um, sometimes there's a lot of control pieces um, and it's a control thing um, that they're keeping it for but specifically the two cases I was working on it seemed to be more about um, paranoid delusional thoughts about what was going to happen to the human waste once they left once it left their home. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question, uh, someone said thanks for the helpful information. Uh, when an individual has several mental health issues and hoarding is one of them, when would it be best to work on their hoarding issues? That's a difficult, difficult one. I would say that you're always trying to do it simultaneously. Um, you're dressing, in terms of the hoarding, people have a right to have as much stuff in their home. So the only time that we can actually pressure somebody to address the hoarding um, behaviors is when it becomes a safety risk. Um, at the, the only, after that, if it's not a safety risk, it's kind of like chipping away at providing information, doing the referrals so that they can get at, and it might be addressing the other symptoms that are going on for that person. Uh, I'm working with somebody who struggles with um, bipolar disorder, ADHD, depression, and hoarding, and there's grief and loss within the hoarding. So it's been, it's been a really long time getting all the professionals involved in her life that she needs to have involved in her life um, to address the hoarding. But usually it's done simultaneously. Uh, most of the interventions that I've done when there's complex um, comorbidities happening, there's psychologists involved, social worker involved, there's case management involved for the day-to-day -day stuff, sometimes occupational therapists and stuff like that. Um, and another tricky thing when addressing hoarding is when you have pain management. Um, if people um, are struggling with pain management, their ability and mobility is impacted. So having somebody from that pain management perspective to kind of work with the team on what, because what's a realistic goal to me might be very unrealistic for Ines, right, depending on what her capacity and mobility is. Um, I've, I've had plans where, for, because of chronic pain recommendations, they're only allowed to work on their hoarded environment for 10-minute intervals three times a day. So you can imagine that's 30 minutes a day that they're actually addressing the clutter within their home. So that takes a long time to address, and that's assuming that they're not accumulating continually, right? Because it would be really difficult to keep on top of that. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Uh, so keep the questions coming. Um, we do have a few more questions here as well. Um, what is the best treatment option for someone with a hoarding disorder? Under the DSM, the best treatment option that's recommended is uh, CBT, um, group behavioral uh, CBT. Um, but in the research, um, I'm actually looking at developing a group as a part of my pathways. Um, but in the research, what I've come to see is the effectiveness of CBT. Um, it's effective for some folks. 
Um, in working with Elaine, who's worked with hoarding for a really long time, she will say the most effective approach to addressing hoarding is in-home, direct one-on-one. -on -one. But as you can imagine, our resources are so, I guess, crunched and, and those type of things, it's really hard to get the buy-in from um, programs and government to fund something that's such an intense one-on-one -on -one thing. So typically, a lot of things go to group treatment um, for hoarding, and it's CBT that's recommended on the DSM. Um, but what I see is the individual work um, is the most effective hands-on hands with the whole team addressing like the underlying psychological reasons and any other um, things that are um, kind of interfering with progress or kind of, I guess, causing the environment to be hoarded. Excellent. Uh, you had talked about your mentor uh, in the community. Uh, is there any specific training that you would recommend for the assessment and treatment of hoarding disorder and what resources you have found particularly helpful? Um, in terms of resources, um, Robert Frost and Christina Skeet, I think her name is Skeet, E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, I think, is how you spell it. They um, were leaders in the States regarding hoarding. They have a clinical guide, and if any of you guys have access to, I guess, the MUN um, journals and those type of things, you can get it there. There's also a really good guide you can access from a harm reduction perspective. It's about, it's a fairly thick, but it's an online version of the book that you can get. It's, um, it's I don't know who the author is, but it's, a harm, it's called A Harm Reduction Approach to Hoarding. Um, Elaine Birchall, who is my community mentor, she's putting out a book that would have some of those things in the fall. Um, but specifically in terms of like assessing risk and those type of things, um, there is some training. It's a clutter. There's a there's a foundation in the states. Um, forget what it's called, but I can get it for you. Um, it's like if you if you like Google it, it's a certification that gives you you can do um, a whole bunch of different certificates um, in different areas in terms of addressing hoarding. Um, and but Robert Frost probably has the best clinical one that you can get right access to on the MUN um, journals. And also on Elaine's www.hoarding.ca, she has a whole bunch of tools um, and things on there. There's two tools that are really commonly used in hoarding interventions. One's called the Clutter Image Rating Scale, and that was developed by Robert Frost. And the other one is the Saving in Inventory Questionnaire. So those are two tools that are often used um, specifically in the research as standardized tools and kind of getting baselines of folks who are living in hoarded environments. Excellent. We also have a comment. Uh, some of the great topic presentation we'll be sharing with their team. So that's always good to hear. <laughs> um, I know you address uh, this in the presentation, but if there's any more information um, around the typical age at which it starts, I know the 35 to 50 when people seek. Um, what has been your experience, though, with children uh, who hoard or anything in the literature around children who hoard? In terms of children who hoard, I've only had two cases where um, I've worked with children, and both of those cases, they were adult children who are living within a family home um, because of other um, cognitive limitations. Um, when I worked at Child Youth and Family Services, when I think back, I, there was a couple of young people that were hoarding food, and a lot of that was based on trauma. Um, but in terms of, there is some literature regarding children um, who hoard, and there's also some literature around children who grow who live in hoarded environments and what their likelihood is to hoard when they get older. Um, I will tell you too, um, on Elaine's website, she did um, a, a radio show. I was off on maternity leave, so yeah. She did a radio show in 2016, in September of 2016, and if you go into her website, it's called Voice America, and there's actually a talk about children who, children and hoarding is actually a specific, um, I think she did, does them for like an hour-long talk show. Um, but yes, yeah, so she had experts call in and speak about children and hoarding. So that might be a good resource to get more information. I don't have a whole lot of experience, I will say, with um, children and hoards, especially young children. Most have been adult children that I've worked with um, who still live in their family home. Thank you. 
Um, so when working with a person with hoarding disorder, what is the general length of time for an effective intervention? So how, in terms of the steps that you would have went through, generally how long does it take to get through those steps? That is very case dependent. Um, I, it depends on the person, how, how much access you have to their space. Because um, you can imagine to do a risk assessment, it, for some folks it's taken me a couple of months to be able to even get in their space to do the risk assessment um, of their space. Um, so I, timelines are really, really difficult to put on. Um, I haven't done an intervention that's been successful that didn't take longer than a couple of years, if that's helpful. Um, they're usually long term. And what we recommend as well, once you do an intervention, you get to a place where the space is um, no longer hoarded, follow up is really, really important um, because that follow up and monitoring is super important to um, kind of get any regression and catch those things early so that we can get the services and support of why that's happening early because, as we all know, for most things, early intervention is most effective. Thank you. Um, in terms of when a person refuses to address the environment, any uh, techniques or tips that you would offer around working with individuals who are refusing? They're the most difficult, um, folks that are refusing to um, engage in services. Um, as I had alluded to earlier, people are allowed to have as much stuff in their house as until there's a risk factor. So really, in terms of working with somebody, you're always trying to build a relationship. But if there's a significant, and I mean a significant, not just a perceived risk factor, um, what I typically have done in the past when folks are resisted, I call in the professionals that that's their expertise. So like there's been a time where I've called, or been several times where I've called in the fire department. And then they actually give them, in two of these cases that I've called them in, have given them like things that needed to be addressed immediately, um, that could be addressed within a couple of weeks. The immediate things they had 24 hours to um, to address and because they were very, very significant safety concerns. Um, and if they didn't address those, this, the fire department was going to step in and take the person out of the home because of safety and fire risk. Um, so that's the extreme. We don't want to use, have to use enforcement, but when there's a significant amount of safety risk and there's no insight into what's going on, um, that's, that's been the extreme I've had to go. I've had to go to the health inspector one time, too, for a Diogenes syndrome um, because the person was um, not in a place recognizing how the environment was impacting them, but also to um, physically um, they were at high risk because they were eating very, very expired, expired food. Um, so we had the health inspector go in. One of the things I will recommend if you're going in with a really, really intrusive approach, which I highly don't recommend, I the, try to ease your way in as much as possible unless you kind of got to and there's a risk factor or a child protection needs to go in because there's a child in there. Um, it's really helpful when the person who's living in the environment has the support and the enforcement. Um, you do not want the support person to also be the enforcer. So in my role at housing, I have been the support sometimes, but I've also been the enforcer because we're the landlord, right? So when the person has a whole bunch of support, I'm the landlord saying this is what we need from a landlord standard, right? Um, so it's kind of working within those teams. But at the end of the day, when there's severe risk and safety concerns, it's calling in those people's job it is to kind of assess safety, which would be the health inspector or the fire department in your area. Sometimes municipalities have bylaws and those types of things, um, so you can use those regulations to kind of, I guess, enforce. But um, enforcement usually doesn't go very well, um, and again, usually they're given limits when they have to address something, to like right now. Um, and do you know what? To be honest, once they address the immediate safety risk, we also had to soften off on our approach then too, um, because it's really about being respectful in their environment um, and keeping risk in mind and balancing those two things out. Excellent. Uh, we still have a few more questions that we can get through. So if any last minute questions, feel free to get them in. Uh, you mentioned about risk, you know, children in the home. What is the risk level for children living in a hoarded environment? Again, this is going to be case by case, and 
I did do, do child protection for a period of time. Um, even when I go into the home and I see child protection concerns, I'm not the person to assess risk. So I would always recommend referring to child protection agencies to um, do that piece. If you're working for child protection and you're wor wondering that yourself, um, one of the things we'll look at when we're talking about hoarding and, and children in a hoarded environment is their developmental age, um, not just the age of the child, because um, one of the things we want to, their ability to protect themselves and keep themselves safe. Um, it depends what's being hoarded. Um, some hoarded environments are very, very tidy and clean, um, so there's no health or health hazards. It's more about do they have um, little objects that they're able to access. Is there towers of like stuff on either sides of the hallways of these narrow pathways? What's the chances and likelihood that's going to topple in on the on a child who might be crawling around the floor? So it's really important to look at the mobility and where they are developmentally as a child and what their ability to kind of um, keep themselves safe. Um, and when we look at children who are older and who have lived in a hoarded environment, they're a lot more able, like I'm working with a family now, and the, the child is a significant, like in the teenage years or early teen years, so um, has significant resources and skills to keep themselves safe, but also this is a normal environment for this person because they've lived in it for a very, uh, um, a significant amount of time. Uh, when we talk about this case, we always talk about, with the child protection person involved, the risk to the child in terms of the environment, but also the risk of emotional safety if the child was removed from the home and placed in care where there's no family support and those type of things. So it's, it's always that balance of safety and risk. Um, the younger the age, the less mobile, the less cognitively able, um, those are all risk factors you want to keep in mind um, in terms of living uh, or their environment that they live in. And also, to what the person or what the family hoarding environment looks like. Is it rotten food that could child could eat that's expired? Is it little tiny uh, marbles on the floor that they can easily swallow? Those type of things. So those are things to keep in mind. Um, thank you. In your experience, following a successful intervention, how can individuals be supported to maintain their environments? Um, follow-up is key, so keeping somebody on a follow-up. Um, in terms of like Newfoundland and Labrador housing, we do regular inspections, or we're supposed to do yearly inspections. Um, so oftentimes people will be followed up with um, on a regular basis. If, if the intervention has just been successful, usually the follow-up will be once a month, and then it will taper off depending on how the length of success they've had. Um, I have folks that I'm working with now that I only check in with once a year um, because they've maintained their environment for a certain period of time. But it's also making sure that the support that you use to get at the underlying reasons why they hoard are still accessible to them, right? So like if there's still things that they have unresolved, it's really making sure that service providers stay involved with them as much as we can. Um, if they're still going to deal with grief or loss. Um, another thing is if you know it's about grief and loss and now they lost their second parent, that's a high risk time, right? So you want to support people through those times. So really knowing the person you're working with and their triggers and it's like addiction on some level and some people look at hoarding as from an addiction lens. Um, that's not always best practice, but it's like think of it that way, right? Like the potential when stress happens, if the change of the home happens. Um, I've seen it when um, not necessarily a pass away, but there's a split of a family or the adult child grows up and moves out of the home. Like So those are all risk factors if they've lived before and it's about grief and loss, kind of making sure they have support during those times. Excellent points. Um, getting back to the health and safety inspector, someone had a question that in their experience, health uh, inspectors with GSC would not intervene in entering the home unless a child or vulnerable individual was living there, even though we had significant concerns regarding things like, say, for example, fire safety. And have you experienced these kinds of challenges? I've only had to use the health inspector on a couple of occasions. Um, and I haven't had any challenges that way um, in terms of people are vulnerable when they live in these environments, right? So sometimes it's about educating the health inspector why you want them to come out and assess the safety risk, right? Um, 
I don't know. I haven't worked with them in the last couple of years, to be honest. Um, but I was working with someone in our local um, a local health inspector. They have. I'm not sure what their requirements are, what they need to respond to. But I think it's a part. If we're calling for them, is advocating, explaining what the risk factor is. Um, if they say they only deal with vulnerable adults, I would argue that um, some it, depending on the environment and the level of hoarding. Um, they would be very vulnerable. And not only are they are vulnerable, emergency response people are vulnerable, and the neighbors are vulnerable. Because if there's a fire in somebody's house that's hoarded, it's going to go up faster and quicker than any other house on the block, right? Um, and people's time to respond. And that's one of the things we drill down in housing is all of our housing units are attached. They're row housing. They're over-unders. Very rarely are you a single detached home, right? So the risk factor in those arrangements look very, very different than if you're a single detached home with um, like lots of space in between you and your neighbor, right? Um, the thing is with hoarded environments, it's not the fire that's actually, go like it's not, you're not going to die because of the fire, you're actually going to die because of the toxins and the fumes that comes from the stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff that we collect nowadays, even our furniture, there's a lot of plastics and toxic stuff that's used in them. It's not just natural wood and natural fibers anymore. Um, so the toxicity of that stuff is what really gets people in fires in order environment. Excellent. Uh, I think we have one time for one more question. Uh, in terms of um, intervening with a person's support, network and their family members. Any uh, tips there in terms of how to effectively work with a person's uh, support network? Consent is huge, <laughs> making sure you do have consent to do that, um, as, as we all know. But one of the other key things is getting a baseline for where they're at. Because there's lots of really great family support. Um, one of the t one of the things when we're doing interventions, we often look to see if there's family or friends. Um, Elaine calls it their Jesse. Somebody you need somebody to be your support. Um, that's a part of your natural your natural network, right? Whether that's a friend, family, neighbor. One of the things I often caution is get to know these people, because sometimes the people in our in our clients' lives are their enablers or the people that are triggering some of the hoarding behaviors. So it's really getting an idea of the role that those support people play in the hoarding behavior. Are they actually going to be non judgmental? Are they going to be patient? Are they going to like not shame the person, blame the person, those type of things? Because if you get a support person who's doing those things, they can really undo any interventions that you are doing. So if you are engaging family, friends, or anybody in community, because we've even engaged neighbors um, that have been significant supports for folks, just make sure. And sometimes it's about giving them information about hoarding and why it is they hoard. Because a lot of people I interact with only know hoarding from media, um, what's on TV and those sensationalized shows. Um, they're not a great representation of what hoarding looks like. Um, so just giving them information so that they're better able to understand that this isn't a choice that they're just getting up every day and choosing to live in this environment. It's something more that's going on. Um, so getting that buy-in and understanding and sympathy from those people because um, I've had really, really positive experiences with family and supports, and they're really, really key. But you got to suss out who's really good a support and who's really presents as a good support, but probably not actually helpful. Oh my goodness, I don't want to finish this conversation. <laughs> this has been fabulous. Uh, but we're almost at the the time uh, to, to, to conclude. Um, so I do want to say a huge thank you, Christina. This was a stellar presentation. And really thank you for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and experience with us today. And I will say events during Social Work Month are organized by our promotion of the Profession Committee, and Christina did not hesitate <laughs> when approached uh, to facilitate this session today. So that is truly appreciated, Christina. Um, so, of course, in the presentation today, you covered a lot of important information about hoarding disorder, what it is, the types of hoarding, and best practices that we can all use to intervene effectively in our helping relationships. The work that Christine is involved in is certainly a wonderful example of how social workers are making a positive impact here in the province. We hope that this session sparked your interest in learning more about hoarding disorder. And it's through this type of knowledge exchange that, and continued learning and reflection and ongoing dialogue that will continue to enhance our knowledge and skills and provide high quality services. 
So, Christina, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and facilitating this webinar today. It is truly appreciated. So the recording of this presentation and the slides will be uploaded to the NLISW website in the coming weeks uh, for your future reference. For those of you who have attended 75 minutes or more of the presentation, confirmation of attendance is available, uh, should be available now by clicking on the yellow icon at the bottom right of your window. And I also encourage everyone to complete the evaluation that should appear on your screen as well. So thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful Social Work Month. And what a great way to start our uh, education series for Social Work Month is to have Christina here today. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.